My earliest memory formed and solidified when I was three years old. I woke up to the sound of my mother screaming. We lived in a blue house in a lower middle class neighborhood somewhere in Texas. The living room had a giant mirror in it. That room and the kitchen were at the front of the house and a long hallway led to the back of the house where my bedroom was on the right and my mom and new stepdad's room was at the back. The sound of screaming bolted me into action that morning, where as a three-year-old vigilante, I grabbed the wooden ruler on my nightstand, ready to fight off the bad guys or the dragons or whatever it was threatening my blue house. I had no fear at three years old. I opened my bedroom to see a pale shirtless man in blue jeans running down my hallway and out the front door. I was suddenly scooped into my mother's arms and set on her right hip. I remember it was her right hip because I was eye level with her bleeding right ear. The memory blurs for a few minutes until we were out in the front yard, still with me on her right hip. The stream of blood going down her ear and neck had now dried to an off brown as we stood there in the front yard with the cop in the cowboy hat. The shirtless intruder, this stranger in blue jeans, was sitting across the street in the front yard, staring the three of us down. I don't remember what my mom said that day, but I still remember what the cop said. Well, what do you want me to do about it? Even as a three-year-old, that rubbed me wrong. So before my mom could say a word, I looked at the shiny revolver on that officer's hip, and I said with stern, matter-of-fact, three-year-old confidence, I want you to shoot him in the ass. <laughs> Not long after that, that's when the fear started. I spent my growing up years shuffling through stepdads, one who beat me so badly one time on the back of my bare legs with a belt that I couldn't sit down for two days. After that revolving door of stepdads, I finally left home, not aware of the scars I was carrying. Little did I know that during my freshman year in college, I would meet my wife. As a matter of fact, I met her about 100 yards from here. The day I met her, she was wearing this colorful sweater and she had this noticeably perky pair of earrings. That's when my tribe really began to form. And I've been co-creating this world with them ever since. And it all started with this 18-year-old girl with the colorful sweater and perky earrings. Five minutes after I met her, I knew I wanted to spend my life with her. Not kidding, five minutes. 24 years later, I'm still sure of that. But some of that confidence came as a result of making a deliberate choice to focus on gratitude and resilience. Because as she and I look back over the past 20-something years, we can't think of a time when we weren't going through some sort of transition. And I think that's true for a lot of us, that if we look at our lives, we are all at some time or another going through a transition. But for me personally, and others I know, who have some rough spots in their assorted pasts, the best transition is the one that goes from pain to healing. I remember when I was 18. I drove to college with all of my worldly possessions stuffed into a 1984 Pontiac Sunbird, the most underwhelming car ever put on the road. The check engine light always stayed on. I just figured the light bulb would burn out eventually. On that drive back in the summer of 1990, I thought that once I left home, I could leave the pain behind. I was on my own now, ready to put the past in the past, confident in the protective walls I had constructed around myself, freshly whitewashed to never experience pain again. I was wrong. After the joy of marrying Jen, five years later, our first son died. 
And then five years after that, my best friend died in a plane crash. Those were years of fear and anxiety. Marathon runners talk about hitting a wall. You know that feeling when you think you can't run anymore? Well, that's when I hit my wall. And then I took my wall and I just built it higher. Brick by brick, illusions of self-protection. All just bricks in the wall. But then it turned. When my two teenagers who are here with me today, back when they were toddlers, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. Leftovers of intruders and mean drunks who like to hit kids. But I stand before you today as a truly happy and content man. I believe that started with a eureka moment and a choice. A choice to pour into my tribe and a choice to be vulnerable enough to let others love me. And that started to tear down the wall. Some of this is as simple as loving others and allowing yourself to be loved. This is nothing profound. Some of it is as simple as being present with whomever you happen to be with at that given moment and not worrying about all the other stuff in your life. If I'm with my motorcycle club and we are riding somewhere, they are all that matters to me at that moment. If I'm with my church people and I get to hold a newborn baby in my arms and pray over that baby and the new family, they are all that matters to me at that moment. And I'll give you one guess. Who matters to me the most at this moment? It's you. Because I believe that a deliberate choice to cultivate gratitude and resilience landed me here with you today. It started with a therapist and a eureka moment. I was bearing the weight of PTSD, filled with anxiety before I knew that it was PTSD. I knew it was time to go see someone when I could not stop imagining what-if tragedies involving my children. On the first day, the first session ever, with this man I'd never met, he completely shifted my approach to life and changed everything about the way I looked at my world. He essentially asked me, are you going to spend the rest of your life reacting as traumatized little boy in the blue house? Or are you ready to learn how to react as an educated adult man, not worried and focused about what might happen, but on those you love and who love you? And that started the shift. And of course, it was more than just that one moment. It had to become a daily commitment to create something, to pour into other people's lives, particularly life-giving members of my tribe who cultivated resilience. Because the research on resilience, like Andrew Zoli's, indicates that resilient groups, that is, groups able to bounce back in the face of ever-changing circumstances, are groups with a daily commitment to resilience. That you don't ever reach a certain point and then get to stop running. You have to decide every day to keep running, watch for the signs, and adjust your route accordingly. I believe that on any given day, the people around us are shaping our lives. And I believe that being a part of a tribe means that you pour into their lives and help shape their lives. And this one's really going to blow your hair back. I believe at this moment that you are shaping me. In 1975, Norman Holland turned the world of literary theory on its ear with his essay, Hamlet, My Greatest Creation. He suggested that as we watch Hamlet, for example, that we are creating with Shakespeare. As my life folds over the written and performed words, then my identity continues to take shape in ways that go far beyond the words on the page, or in this case, performed words on stage. So let's take that idea and let's apply it to the people in our lives. Let's create something together. I'd like to invite you right now to create something with me. My wife, Jen, is now a therapist 
who warns her clients against swinging their thoughts toward the negative people in their lives. You know how some people just give you life and other people just suck the life right out of you? Well, give attention to the givers and beware the suckers. They're the ones, she says, who always go around shooting on people. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Those micromanagers who flitter around your life. You should do this. You should do that. Of course, it can be even worse when you should on yourself. <laughs> Turn to the person next to you, please. Turn to the person next to you and say, you need to hear this. All right, you ready? Here it comes. Don't let people shoot on you. <laughs> there are some people you have to just tell gently, look, I don't meet the height requirement to ride your emotional roller coaster. <laughs> but then there are others, people in this lifelong race, who just fill you with life. So let's create something together. Picture someone or a group of people who fill you with life. Do you have someone in mind? Okay, let's keep running. One such group of people who just fill me with life is my motorcycle club, the Gypsies. I am a patch holder in the Gypsy MC, and my road name is Truck. When I decided I wanted to at least make a run at patching into a motorcycle club, I wanted a traditional three-piece patch motorcycle club. But when some of the Houston chapter members found out I was a preacher, well, let's just say it raised some eyebrows. They started referring to me as Friar Tuck. <laughs> but I didn't let it bother me. I just kept showing up. And when they realized that I was both serious and non-judgmental, Friar Tuck evolved into a term of endearment. Well, one time I was on my way to a run, and two of the brothers were already at the run. They were in for the night, and so one of them was already a hair past tipsy when he asked when I was going to arrive. Only it came out like, hey, where's Friar Truck? And that became Truck. And now years later... Many of them are as close to me as blood family. My road name became a running illustration of the difference between hurt little boy and grown man who perseveres with gratitude and resilience. Same thing with my soccer team that I coach at Carnegie Vanguard High School. The first day that some of them got a load of me, apparently I made them nervous. I don't know why. And so they started calling me a name behind my back, something about nicknames and me. Start calling me a name behind my back. Heisenberg. <laughs> Walter White from Breaking Bad. But when they realized that I would work them very hard, but that I cared about them, and that I expected them, not told them, I expected them to be men of character, my soccer team became another place to practice. The difference between little boy who might get my feelings hurt and grown man dedicated to building up others, running alongside people I love and who love me. Speaking of running, one more illustration. I used to do a lot of competitive running and triathlons. I ran one marathon. That was plenty. They say you don't sign up for your second marathon until you forget your first. Well, I haven't forgotten my first, and that was 10 years ago. Back when I was racing regularly, this was before the days of GPS. You might not know the race course ahead of time. You put your toe on the line, horn goes off, off you go. And the only way to get from starting line to finish line is to watch for the signs and adjust your route accordingly. So what are the signs for a life of gratitude and resilience with your tribe? Well, you know this person or group of people you're holding in your mind right now? That's a good place to start. That's a good place to swing your focus. But don't forget to give attention to the other side. 
If at the end of the day you find yourself just drained of life after being with certain people, here's a profound thought. Maybe you shouldn't spend so much time with them. Or if you are in a bad office environment or school environment where people should on you all day, don't take them home with you. Don't give them space in your thoughts. Watch for the signs and adjust your route accordingly. If you find yourself in a scenario that just sucks the life out of you, ask yourself if it's really worth it. It's why my grandmother used to say, life is too long. Not that life is too short. She would say things like, life is too long to drink bad coffee. But on the days when you drink bad coffee, brush your teeth and move on. In spite of some of the paths you may have run in the past, paths you wish you could do over, or leftover scars from childhood, I believe that today can be a day of created resilience, a day of strength that tears down walls. I mean, look at this world we've just created together. This world did not exist 15 minutes ago, but for some, it might be a new beginning, a new life strategy, a day of created resilience. My faith has saved my life. But I also believe that faith in its concrete form, where I see it most apparently, is with my tribe. And today, that includes you and the people you hold who fill you with life. Look, I know that we can't see what our circumstances will bring tomorrow, but we can plan who we are going to be. Even in the wake of some bad yesterdays, it's the same. Wear your tragedies as armor, not shackles. Yesterday is done. And tomorrow doesn't matter yet. Because a commitment we make to resilience is a commitment we make today. Watch for the signs and adjust your route accordingly. It's a quote from E.L. Doctoro that a teacher of mine shared with us years ago. We can only see as far as the headlights, but we can make the whole trip that way. Thank you, my tribe, for what we have created here today together.